it is interesting that in the intro, we mentioned about year-round color in my garden, and that is one of my major focuses when gardening. Um, and I'm doing the presentation tonight. So we're, we're going to talk about color in your garden all year, um, but we're also going to talk about some of the things you need to do to prep your garden and the times of year that those things need to happen. So um, uh, this presentation tonight is brought to you by Tarrant Regional Water District. There are our water supply um, entity. They handle um, all of the huge pipelines that come from Richland Chambers, Teeter Creek, Bridgeport to supply us with our water. They also, in their mission, manage flood control and or recreation um, around large bodies of water. So. Um, they're, um, they're an entity that they've partnered with Tarrant County Master Gardeners to, um, to help us, to, for us to help them spread the word on water conservation. And um, so the, um, some of they are really wanting to encourage people to have um, their sprinklers checked. And we'll talk a little bit about that during the presentation, but uh, free sprinkler checks are available uh, to Tarrant County residents on their SaveTarrantWater.com. Um, they also uh, provide a weekly uh, newsletter that talks about watering advice, such as if it rained, you can turn your sprinklers off, things like that. Um, granted, we're a large area um, that they cover, so it may have rained in Mansfield and it didn't rain here in North Keller um, area, but um, so you have to kind of um, uh, assign it to your, your area. But um, they also have a calendar of events, uh, things that they participate in, things they promote. And then the classes just like this one, um, this one is uh, brought to you by North Richland Hills and Tarrant Regional Water District. And, um, uh, and they do this, they partner with many community um, uh, uh, communities across the North Tech, uh, Tarrant County area to bring these kind of presentations. So, um, so we're going to talk about color in your garden as well as maintenance in your garden. And so this is my garden. There's four seasons. Um, and you can see one is um, hellebores with snow on them. Um, the next is my April, um, late March, early April irises. And then the next is uh, midsummer. Um, and obviously the most lush looking is right around June. And then in October, the, the Japanese maple is in bloom. Um, we're not as fortunate as other places in the country. Um, we have a lot of fortunate things about gardening, but like my sister in Michigan, everything blooms at one time in Michigan. And so um, uh, they don't have this a little bit here, a little bit there type scenario. It's, it's all at one time. But in Texas, we tend to have the ability to garden with a little bit of color all year round. And that's what I like to focus on. So here is winter. We're going to talk about December 1st. Um, uh, start with December. The things that would be in bloom in my garden um, and or growing and happy are camellia. Um, and we can grow those here in North Texas. Um, I know that they grow very well in South Texas and, and Louisiana, but we can grow them here. Um, they do prefer uh, morning sun, afternoon shade. They don't perform well with a lot of um, late afternoon sun. Um, they do I like more of an acidic soil. Sometimes I'll put ashes around the bottom of it, that type of thing. The other item that um, is really fun, it's a green, um, it's Arum italicum. It is the green leaf. It kind of looks like a hosta maybe, um, kind of looks like a elephant ear or a palladium, but it is a bulb and it grows in the ground. It's dormant all year and it comes up in the winter. So right now under my um, Japanese maples that had no leaves um, in December, this, this green 
um, beautiful green foliage was growing underneath them. So that's very pretty. And you can find some arum type um, plants in some of the nurseries. Um, the next one is something we all love. Uh, it's a winter flowering plant. I find that it flowers more in the end of January. It's the hellebores and Lenten rose. Um, they come in varieties of colors and they have like double blooms. They send up beautiful little flowers and then the rest of the year, um, they'll, their green growth will um, come out um, in, in mass quantities. Um, I will tell you that if we get an early freeze like we did in December this year, um, the foliage will um, look pretty burnt and um, uh, it won't look very pretty when the flower starts to bloom. And that was the case in my garden this year. The next uh, month of January, um, usually the flowering quince is going to be the very first thing that blooms um, in North Texas. You can, um, it's sort of a head jerker. It's kind of a wild, um, thorny type plant, but you can, if you spend some time over the years, trim it and keep it pruned um, to where it's more manageable and it's not so um, uh, rustic looking. And, um, but it's beautiful. I have a, a apricot one that is a little um, uh, slower growing than the traditional uh, red one that you see here. The, the other um, item that you may see in your garden or have plant in your garden are the muscari, the little grape hyacinth. Um, these are really, really cute but they're tiny. They're only about four or five, six inches. Now they do have varieties that are a lot taller. They don't grow as well in our area, but this is adorable little thing. The green foliage comes out in the fall and the little flower comes up in the, um, in January, February timeframe. Um, actually mine are just started blooming two weeks ago, but a friend of mine gave me a bag full of maybe a thousand little tiny bulbs. I planted them and um, maybe when I'm a hundred, it'll fill in the border <laughs> when that I have uh, them located. But right now they're just sort of four and five inch clumps and um, they're little sweet surprises. Um, it don't, definitely, um, definitely pretty. Obviously daffodils, and um, if you're not real familiar with daffodils, there are early bloomers and late bloomers, mid bloomers, and just like with irises and some of our other um, uh, perennials, um, the uh, so I challenge you to find daffodils that are in all three categories, so that when one group is um, spent and bloomed out, then you have another group starting. And, um, and I can't stress enough, if you have an area you can plant daffodils, is don't just plant six, plant 60, um, because every bulb won't bloom. Um, in some varieties, um, your bloom rate is, is pretty low. Um, and so, so I do challenge you to get out there and, and research daffodils. They're just a great addition to a garden. Um, so those are January. The other thing we have in our winter and we cannot forget is our green, our evergreen. And so many times I'll pass by people's homes and they'll have a lot of um, deciduous trees and deciduous plants, but they've forgotten to put the anchors up against the house or, or in areas. And I always encourage when you're putting a new flower bed in or you're putting, um, redoing a flower bed is that you always have your um, evergreen uh, anchor shrubs. Um, and um, obviously uh, there's a number of them. This one on the left is um, more of a boxwood. And I know a lot of people like to prune them square and that's acceptable in England. Um, they look so much nicer when they're pruned fluffy. Uh, the middle one is a Nellie R. Stevens 
and people do make the mistake of putting one of these up against a house. Nellie R. Stevens can get to be 20 feet tall and 20 feet wide. Um, so um, there are uh, Burford, dwarf Burfords, things like that, that might be a little bit better. Uh, you're gonna spend your whole life pruning the Nellie. Um, and then the um, um, one on the right is a foster holly and they grow more in a pyramid shape and just need a light pruning. They can get very tall. I have um, I have two that are probably a good 19 feet tall and taller than I want, but they've been in place for a long time. So, um, but don't forget the evergreen. Uh, winter shrubs that are wonderful for your garden. Um, there's the possum all holly. It's a uh, holly and it is deciduous though, unlike some of the other hollies. It has a beautiful red berries. Uh, the birds love them. Some years the berry, um, it presents berries very well. Some years it doesn't. Um, it can get little um, suckers down at the bottom of the tree or shrub. And you sometimes need to come in and prune that to keep it in control. But it's a beautiful addition. I have one um, behind my pool area, uh, and it just is real pretty to see, to look out in the winter and see that. Um, the other thing are nandinas, and uh, we don't really promote the domestica, the standard nandina that gets tall and bamboo-y. Uh, we're promoting more of the dwarf varieties, and there's many to choose from, whether you like the really, really strong reds in the winter. This one um, is by Firepower, and it just turns a bright red in the winter, and it's just beautiful. But there's more, there's some Nandinas that are um, uh, more in the gold tones in the, in the winter or green tones. Um, the dwarf Nandinas are not near, aren't as invasive because they don't bury. Um, unlike the standard Nandina, which is tall and bamboo and leggy. Um, then the other um, plant that there are many varieties of that is, uh, has to be in a garden uh, is a abelia. The one to the right here is called the kaleidoscope, and it's a beautiful um, shrub. Now, some Abelias will drop some of their leaves in a harsh winter like we've had recently, um, but they they leaf back out. So before you prune them hard, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about pruning, before you prune them hard, look at the viability of the, the stem. Only prune for, for uh, shape uh, because they will leaf out almost all the way out on their old stems. Um, some other winter evergreen that um, are great additions to a uh, garden and um, just help keep niceness in your um, nice looking uh, flower beds are like the blue rug juniper. They like full sun. They're all awesome to trail down a retaining wall of some sort. Um, they can have little sections that die out and then you you may have to prune those out at times, uh, but uh, they're beautiful. Um, dwarf liriope, uh, mondo grass. It's not the tiny little um, dwarf mondo. It is a liriope that is about six to eight inches tall. Um, and it's great this year. However, that early freeze that we got in December um, zapped mine. I have tons of it in different places under Japanese maples, around sewer lids, things like that. And they look pretty bad. This is the first year I've ever noticed that they're all brown, the liriope. And so a good haircut um, will allow the new growth to come out. The plant is not dead by any means. It just um, just took a took a hit. Um, Indian hawthorn. I did this presentation and I put it together before our big freeze that we had two years ago. I probably wouldn't put Indian hawthorn in here again. Um, I lost several from that big freeze, but um, 
you could take a risk with it. They make a beautiful shrub in your garden. Um, Japanese holly fern, uh, it will this year, it, it kind of lost most of its um, fronds as well. And normally it doesn't. Normally uh, we have quite a few green fronds throughout the winter and then it sits, uh, sends up its new um, growth in the spring, but a great addition um, to a garden as well. So let's talk about a little bit between seasons here. We're between winter and spring. Winter garden cleanup. And some of the things you really want to, want to do in your winter garden um, is pruning deciduous shrubs and perennials by early March. Um, and so if you have, um, the reason we want to prune them now is because pruning helps promote new growth. And then we don't want to prune shrubs in May after they've set some new growth because the new growth is what makes them soft and fluffy. So sometimes we prune them a little hard in February. So do not prune spring flowering shrubs. So if you have azaleas, do not prune them in February. Prune the azaleas, I'll talk about when to prune those later, but um, I have a wajilia. If I had pruned my wajilia um, in February, I wouldn't have any blooms on it right now. And I'm gonna show you a picture of a wajilia in a few minutes. Uh, we love to prune roses very heavy, um, about two thirds, and you prune out dead. I mean, they look pretty skeletonly um, after we've done our pruning in February. And roses love to be pruned, um, and they need that. And they'll set out some new growth, and they'll just grow and be beautiful. If you don't prune your roses, um, they will get leggy, and they their new growth will be stunted. So um, definitely prune your roses. Um, clean out your flower beds, remove any weed seedlings. Um, sometimes I see all these little dicot little weed seedlings and I take a, my hoy knife, which is a, a really stout knife, and I just run it across the um, mulch or the ground and I sort of um, disrupt all of them. So I'm not actually pulling every one of them. I'm just sort of making sure that their root structure is damaged and that they can't grow. Um, I remove the majority of my leaves in uh, February from my beds. I leave them on through December and January. I still leave a few leaves, especially if I'm gonna come back and do some mulching. Um, I don't leave like a whole layer, but I I'm, don't have to pick the flower bed clean. Um, because I'm going to come back and put some mulch on it, or I just want those few leaves to decompose. Um, add compost around plants and shrubs prior to laying down mulch. Um, some people will compost and they make a really fine compost, and that's great. You can amend your soil with that or whatever, but compost is not mulch. Compost is just soil. So you want to put it under your mulch. Um, replenish your mulch if needed and rake it smooth if it, or rake it smooth if it appears clump. And I use um, shredded cedar mulch and it tends to want to clump on me. Um, and it's really funny. I put out all this mulch and then the next year I come back and I'm like, where's the mulch? And um, it just is either disintegrating or blowing into my neighbor's yard. I haven't figured it out yet, but it's like every year I think, well, I don't have foot mulch down this year. I put so much down last year and I get out there and I start working and there's no mulch. And um, so, but it does clump and I do have to, I, as I'm cleaning out the beds, I sort of um, uh, rake it up and um, smooth it out. So prep, prep your new flower beds. Um, if you want to put one in, this is uh, February, end of February, March is the perfect time. Dig your grass out of your planting area. If you spray to kill your grass, if I say you don't want to dig the grass area uh, up, we're going to put the planting. Um, and it may not even be a really grassy area. It may just be an area that has a lot of weeds in it. If you don't want to dig that top two or three layer, uh, inch layer up, 
um, and get it out of there and you want to spray it, when you spray that, you have to wait eight weeks to plant anything in it. Um, and that's uh, that's time. That's uh, That gets you into May. And planting in May is, is hard in Texas. You need to plant in April or if you can, March, April. Um, because, you know, we get into June and July really quick with those hot weather. So if you really know you want to put a planting area in and you want to kill with uh, um, some type of weed killer or grass killer, then you need to be thinking about that in early February. Um, you can still, um, you can till up the soil and amend as needed um, uh, after you remove the grass. Uh, don't just till the grass in. All you're doing is burying the grass seed down further and you're not getting rid of the grass. You will have grass in the flower bed if you just till it up. That does not kill the grass. Um, Clay needs um, sand, peat moss, expanded shell, and compost. If you have a lot of clay in your tilling, you might add some of that in. Sandy soils need compost, and I like to add landscape mix. I buy landscape mix in bags, and it has it's chunky. It's not like necessarily like potting soil. It's um, uh, it's chunkier, and it's not quite as heavy as mulch. And I will mix that into my sandy soil. Uh, raised beds, um, you can use a landscape fabric over your um, ground um, prior to filling the raised bed. Just make sure it's you know, heavy duty landscape fabric. Don't necessarily have to remove the grass. I would recommend it. Um, and then I don't recommend just putting landscape fabric over grass and making a flower bed. I absolutely don't because the landscape fabric will break down and that grass will uh, still come up. Um, I obtain high quality garden mix to fill the raised beds. Um, some of our um, bulk um, uh, supply places um, have um, like living earth and such. They have specific mixes just for vegetables or they have specific it mixes for um, gardens and, and it's really worth your time to get a pickup truck or a trailer and go get some of that. Um, don't just use all compost. Compost is very rich in nitrogen and um, in some of our vegetables and such can't handle that. Um, and don't just use all garden mix. I like to blend um, those together. Um, blended soil will retain water but will also allow it to drain. Install a dripper hose system if possible, which allows for flexibility in planting. So that's something you need to do in your flower beds. It's, it's um, uh, you may not particularly be able to do it, but you probably know somebody who will be able to help you do it. So now let's talk about February, March. Um, we're getting into more springtime. Forsythia, my Forsythia bloomed in February. Um, bridal wreaths, spirea, those are head turners when you see those on somebody's um, landscape. Um, big, beautiful bushes are just gorgeous. And then the saucer magnolia. Um, I have two varieties. One um, always gets zapped by the freeze, and um, the blooms get burnt, and it just never, uh, it, it's just never pretty. I think I've only had one year of it looking pretty. Um, but then I have another variety called a Jane uh, Magnolia, and it has a dark purple uh, bloom. And it um, it got hit with a freeze this year as well, but some of the buds had not made it out yet. So they came out and they were beautiful. So it's a, more of a dwarf variety. Uh, there's probably 50 different varieties. Um, so uh, if you can find one that's a later bloomer, then that's going to be your best bet. Then we have azaleas, and we can grow azaleas here. If we can grow camellias, we can grow azaleas. And I actually have some, and bless their hearts, they're in more sun than they, they would love like to have. 
but they're troopers. They keep going. They don't get all the late afternoon sun, but they get too much midday sun. And um, uh, but therefore, they're just not um, growing well. Um, and I should probably move them. But anyhow, azaleas are beautiful, and they do add some early spring color to your your garden. Um, a juga, a juga. <laughs> The little blue shoots come up. Some people think they're Texas blue bonnets. They're not. Um, the bees absolutely love a juga. A juga works great under deciduous trees. So if you have um, oak trees or anything that loses its leaves um, and you want a ground cover under those tr that tree, a juga is perfect for that. It takes a lot of it to fill under a tree. But the reason it's perfect under a deciduous tree is because uh, it needs that winter sun to set its blooms and uh, it needs the summer shade to stay alive. So um, it will bloom beautifully in the spring and usually around Easter. Um, some of my little dwarf varieties are blooming right now. They're very pretty. Um, and, but it is, it does like a little bit of water and it does like summer shade for sure. Um, one of the other plants that I absolutely love, and they do sell them here, they're it's called a wagilia. It's the bottom pitcher. Uh, mine is more of a tall shrub. Um, I also probably planted it in too much full sun for the summer and uh, summer months. Um, and it would probably have done better. Um, in another location, uh, but it does bloom. It blooms a million blooms on these beautiful stems, and it's pink, but there's purple varieties. I know at Grapevine Botanic Garden, they have a purple one, um, and so put that on your wish list if you have some morning sun and afternoon shade. So March gardening to-dos, um, you know, want to treat your lawn right now with a pre-emergent for summer weeds. Now you're, you're going to say the same thing I said, hey, Neil Sperry, the weeds out there in my yard are already there. So why would I put a pre-emergent down? Because, you know, I've got hen bit, I've got all of that real sticky stuff that likes to, you know, attack you when you walk through it. Um, and um, what we're applying the pre-emergent for now are the summer weeds. Um, and um, so it's not, we're, we're trying to keep the seed from the summer weeds from last year from germinating. Um, and so that's what we're treating for now, not the weeds that are already in our yard. We treat those in September. And I'll um, get to that in our um, fall to do's. Um, so it needs to be done now. Um, perform a sprinkler check. We have a large sprinkler system here at our home. And, um, you know, weed eaters, um, lawn mowers, uh, just all kinds of things can um, make a, a head pop off. Um, we have a ghost that goes around and turns our little nozzles and they'll be spraying the house. And we haven't figured out how that's happening, but it may be on, like on a tall pole and there's a nozzle on the top. And all of a sudden we go out there and it's spraying the house and it's not spraying the plants. We have not figured that one out, but it's um, somebody's playing tricks on us. But um, anyhow, so always do a sprinkler check and it's always great to do it before you need the sprinkler system. Um, Consider converting overhead sprinklers to drip systems. Um, try converting one area of your yard a year to a drip system. Don't try to take the whole yard on. Just look at um, one small garden area where you may have two heads that pop up and do overhead spraying um, and consider converting those to a drip system. Um, you will find that that bed will do far better throughout the summer um, than some of the other parts of your yard. Fertilize lawn and flower beds. Um, when the nighttime temperatures stay um, about 60 degrees or higher, your grass is not going to grow until the nighttime temperatures are 60 degrees or higher. So next week, 
you're not going to see any grass growth. You may see some um, uh, some weed growth, but you're not going to see a lot of grass growth. It has to start getting really warm. Um, and that's when the grass will take up the fertilizer. Um, and that's when the plants will take up the fertilizer, when they're in their heavy growth mode. Um, then divide clumping perennials like hosta. So as I'm working through my flower beds, cleaning up leaves and things like that, um, I'm taking note of, of plants where I can, I can divide a hosta and I can have um, maybe two more hostas and I didn't have to go buy them. So, um, or I can give one to a friend or something like that. So, um, so consider, you know, dividing some of your perennials, um, the um, all kinds of things like the um, purple heart, the um, columbines, um, their columbines are getting ready to bloom. So it might be a little late for dividing those, but there's um, uh, artemisias, all kinds of plants you could divide right now um, and, um, and get more plants for your other parts of your garden. Um, install rain barrels and uh, Tech, Tarrant County Master Gardeners works with TRWD to do rain barrel uh, classes and such. And uh, we're going to have some rains hopefully in the spring and they would fill those rain barrels up. So now we're into spring plants. Um, and this is my favorite time of year. If you're a gardener in Texas, I'm sure it's yours too. So I have a huge collection of irises. Um, and so our irises are going to be popping um, here in a few weeks. And I can already, already see the buds kind of coming up through the leaves. Um, we have bleeding heart. Um, I have seen this in people's gardens. I do not have any myself. I would love some. Um, it's a beautiful addition in a shade garden. Amaryllis. Uh, my hardy amaryllises are all coming up out of the ground. I don't believe they'll be in bloom until April, the end of April. Uh, we have columbine that's going to be just in massive bloom by mid to late April. And then your African false hosta, which you might not be familiar with, it's a little lily. And you'll see um, you can get it in some of these um, nurseries but you can also get it from a friend um, like me. And um, it, it's a cute little plant. It's more, it's all green. It has a little flower stalk that's insignificant uh, and it spreads pretty easily. And it's just a really sweet ground cover um, for a shady area. Um, not a large shady area, just shady area. So let's talk about uh, spring trees and shrubs. April, some really neat plants will start blooming. We have the mock orange, which um, uh, I have some. It's um, the flowers are supposed to smell like orange, but mine don't. Um, I've shared it with quite a few people. Uh, it uh, does travel on you when you plant it. It will send up suckers in places. And so it's easy to divide and share. Um, it's best if it's in an area that is more contained, but it can get really tall. I think mine's probably 10 feet tall. Um, and I'll prune some of those after it blooms so that it, I can manage the height of it. Um, but it has thousands of these white blooms on it. It's just beautiful. And they cast cascade down um, on these stems and uh, just a beautiful addition um, to a garden. And then um, we have the Laura Padalum, uh, the fringe flower, uh, fringe plant, it's, uh, will get canker disease. Um, I had to rip all of mine out due to canker disease, uh, but people are still planting it. Most people don't have as much success with the little pixies, the little ones. Uh, they have more success with the bigger ones and they uh, trimmed correctly. Uh, they can make a great addition to a garden. And then of course we have our red buds and they're in full bloom right now and they're beautiful. Um, I will tell you, uh, red buds are maybe a 20 uh, year life tree. Um, and if they're in harsh conditions, 
they will survive, but they won't live as long. And I have one that gets too much, um, the people who built the house planted it and it gets way too much summer sun and it's just not thrived as well. And I believe that I'll lose it in a year or two. Um, but they're beautiful addition to your yard. And I recommend them. There's different varieties. There's an Oklahoma, which is a, a real dark red. Um, and then, uh, so look at all the different varieties when you're shopping for those. More shrubs and trees. Um, dogwoods will grow here. with are pink ones and white ones. Um, those of us who have sandy soil or in the cross timbers area, they're going to be more successful with these. Um, there are the uh, peach trees and you know, your fruit trees, pears, not necessarily Bradford pear. I don't recommend the Bradford pear as a landscape tree. Um, and But they're all, you may not get the fruit you're looking for, um, but you will get some beautiful blooms. Um, rough leaf dogwood, uh, that is a, in the dogwood family. It um, is an, it's a neat um, a tree. It's not going to be a large tree, just like a, a dogwood, uh, but it makes a little cluster flower. And this is the bottom picture. Uh, it can send up some suckers and spread. It can be found more in the wild, I think. Uh, but it's, it's an addition. There's also an evergreen dogwood that I actually have not seen uh, very many of those but there is an evergreen dogwood and it makes a little a white flower with bracts, but it doesn't look like a regular white dogwood flower. So anyhow, the two, three more things for you to consider. And so let's jump into May and May is when the yard starts to explode. So we've had our irises, now we're getting into our daylilies. And so now I have you know, a huge collection of different daylilies. And I have early bloomers, mid bloomers, and late bloomers. So again, most a lot of plants have varieties like that, and it's always neat to share uh, to get the varieties of them in your garden, so that everything uh, will spread out a little bit. But we have bee balm, which is what's in the red. That's called Jacob Klein bee balm. It is fabulous. It is just tall, five feet tall with these ur sea urchin blooms. The bees just love it. And um, it's it's a wonderful plant. Um, mine, I think, in one area died out from the drought this last summer. And um, uh, then we have Greg's mist flower, which the bees and butterflies love. It will spread um, and so every spring I'm sort of rip out a whole bunch of it and throw it away and just let it spread back out. And then one of my favorite additions to the garden is rain lily. And there are many varieties of rain lilies and I've just sort of gotten into those and I probably have six or seven and they're supposed to bloom about when like the barometric pressure changes, but the uh, they will sometimes bloom at other times, and then if you read on about the bottom, they'll say they bloom in September. So I will have some in bloom here shortly. Some bigger, not necessarily this variety that's showing the pink. Um, I will have some in bloom here shortly. But I've known people to have apricot colored ones, white ones, pink. Um, they're just adorable and they're a bulb and they just um, add a little surprise to your garden. So consider rain lilies. And then in May, we also have things like Solomon's seal. There's a variegated, that's the top um, left uh, picture. That's the variegated Solomon's seal. There's a, a solid uh, green Solomon's seal, shade loving uh, plant. Uh, coneflower, those will bloom in May and June really well. They are full sun. And then we have Stokes Aster, which you may not have heard about. Excuse me. You may be familiar with a lot of asters uh, that are blooming in the spring and the summer, but um, Stokes Aster, um, I'm sorry, 
all the other asters bloom in the fall. I'm sorry, Stokes aster blooms in the spring and summer. And it's a purple um, flower uh, and it, it's really a neat plant. Um, and I have it in several places in one area where it didn't get enough water last year, it's dying out. Last year was brutal. There just, it didn't matter. You couldn't put enough water on your ground. We just didn't have any rain. It was just really hard. Um, spring shrubs, obviously, oak leaf hydrangeas. There's some great varieties. There's some dwarf varieties right now that you may love um, to add in a shady area in your yard. Knockout roses, I know they're a little um, overused and they can get a rose rosette. Um, and there's um, drift roses as well. I think that if you have a large enough yard and, you, um, and you're willing to take a chance, um, it always adds an element to a yard to have some roses. So I, I kind of consider, I would consider planting them um, and then taking your chances with the rose rosette. Uh, rose rosette's here, it's here to stay for a long time. Um, and you know, you might get four or five years out of the rose before you have to um, eliminate it. Um, so there's also a Caria japonica, it's the yellow pitcher. Uh, it's a wonderful plant and it likes more morning sun, afternoon shade. It makes a, a little button flower that's like a, there's a single flower and a double flower. And most of us have the double and it makes a little button flower and it, it's just really pretty. Um, it's almost like a forsythia, it's almost like a bridal spirea, but it's um, a caria japonica, so a little different. And then we have our regular hydrangeas. And of course our soils are not acidic enough for them to be bright blue, um, but, um, and there's very many different varieties of hydrangeas um, in the classic hydrangea family. Um, uh, and I think they're a great addition. I have several that were my from my grandmother's plant in Tennessee, and they just don't do that great here. They're here. They're they're okay, but they're just not um, doing fabulous. But um, but I, the big ones you see, like when you go into a big box store and you see a hydrangea in a pot and it has these big huge blooms on it, um, those. Uh, those have been over fertilized and forced and to adapt them into your garden is really hard. Um, sometimes you just have to get a scrawly looking hydrangea from a friend, like maybe they um, propagated one or something like that and start there, something that's more um, um, adapted to our area. Uh, spring shrubs uh, that we love, Vitex, they're beautiful, they're purple, uh, uh, blooms on a nice shrub. Some people tree them up like a crepe myrtle. Um, crepe myrtles, you can't go wrong. You have to have a crepe myrtle or two. Lots of different varieties um, of crepe myrtles. Um, crepe myrtles don't have to be pruned, um, don't need to be pruned. You can prune selectively but the chopping them off uh, at, you know, partially is not recommended. And, but we see it done, we see it done time and time again. Um, late spring garden checks. So uh, plants grow tall. Uh, so make sure your plants have not blocked a sprinkler head, especially if it's a new garden. Um, we find this even with our older gardens that um, the plants now, for some reason, block the sprinkler head. So, um, you know, we have to get out there and, and make some adjustments. Uh, sometimes I prune the plant. Sometimes I move the head. Sometimes I just raise the head up. Um, check sprinkler heads to make sure that they're, they're not leaking um, and that you haven't run over one of the heads with their lawnmower. We, we tend to do that a lot in our garden just because you just never know. Um, clear out any dead growth from winter flowering plants. Um, some of your daffodils by now in um, 
late spring, early summer, you can go ahead and uh, prune the foliage off of daffodils that's spent. Um, you can trim your azaleas and wagelias and other spring flowering shrubs now. So the reason you want to prune them after they bloom and after they're spent is so they'll set some new growth and you won't disrupt their um, uh, bud setting in the fall for spring. So if you, if you wait till fall, it may be okay, but we definitely don't want to prune any of those shrubs, those spring flowering shrubs in, um, uh, in February. And check your spring planters uh, because a lot of times our spring annuals don't really hold up, uh, especially um, uh, oh, well, I can't even think of them anymore. But um, anyhow, so uh, a lot of our spring annuals don't hold up, so you might want to replace those annuals. Um, I love to plant pots with uh, perennials. I put perennials in my pots, um, but I also have a garden house that I can put tender perennial type plants in um, over the winter. Um, but I love to put daylilies um, and just all kinds of perennials in my pots. Um, but I also will put an, an annual or two in there as well. Um, plan to fertilize again in June. So we fertilized in. Uh, March, um, and you want to fertilize again in June. Um, summer to June, and there's so, June to August, there are so many plants that bloom uh, in Texas. So you have your Zexminia. If you don't have that in your garden and you have sun, then you're missing out. It's a wonderful plant. It goes about three feet tall. Um, yarrow, uh, yarrow is real tricky. Some people are real successful with it. Um, some of us are not, uh, don't know why, uh, but it, it's a, a great addition. You can try it. Milkweed, this is a tropical milkweed. Um, and I grow that in my yard. It tends to work really, um, it tends to grow best for me. The other milkweeds, um, a lot of milkweeds, when people say, well, you'll see them out in the field or they grow out in the field, they grow in the wild. Well, that kind of tells you they don't want to grow in your flower bed with all the compost and everything. They like those cracks in the ground in the uh, clay soil out in the field. And um, so I don't know a lot of people that have a lot of success with um, like um, antelope corn, uh, milkweed in their garden, but the tropical milkweed is pretty, it grows tall. Uh, people will say that it, um, two things, one, it blooms later, uh, can bloom later, and it disrupts the monarch's cycle. Uh, the other is that it has some type of enzyme in it that could prevent monarchs, I think, from reproducing or something. So um, I don't know, but I talked to an expert on monarch uh, migration. And they said, you know, pretty much now, because food is so hard to come by for monarchs, that um, any, any milkweed is okay. So I'm going with that. Um, Turk's cap. Turk's cap is a great um, perennial for Texas. It comes in pink and red. Um, great for bees and butterflies. It gets to be a pretty good-sized bush. You can cut it all the way down to the ground in the spring, if, uh, in March, if you like and it'll just come right back. Summer to June, August, um, more really, this is when your salvia greg eyes are just going to burst into flowers. Um, you've pruned those really hard back in February. Um, they're gonna be beautiful and flowy and soft. Uh, you've got Brazilian rock rose, there's lots of um, some, several other varieties. Red hot pokers. If you've got a lot of really um, dry areas in your um, yard, non fertile areas, red hot pokers are going to work for you. Um, standing cypress is going to, uh, well, 
standing cypress tends to want their feet wet. Um, so if you've got a drainage area, um, like maybe your neighbor's yard drains to you and it's kind of wet, you might try standing cypress um, in uh, that area. And more plants, uh, purple heart. I use purple heart in my garden because I have an acre and it's just a beautiful constant con uh, pop of purple color that I can, I can um, arrange my plants around and make them look cohesive. Um, I think it just really adds fullness to a garden. Then you have phlox. Um, there's all kinds of, there's summer phlox, which is my favorite. It gets to be four or five feet tall with big pink, purple um, pink blooms on it. Um, but there's several other, um, uh, several other varieties of phlox um, that you might consider in your garden. Then we have lantana for full sun. You can't go wrong with lantana. It's going to look the prettiest in August. Um, and then hostas uh, will bloom in, in June and they'll shoot up, send up these beautiful um, flower stalks. Uh, one of the hostas that does the best for me, uh, all the hostas I've ever planted, is a variety called So Sweet. It's S O S W E E T. And um, I, every time I see it in a nursery, I want to buy one, but my clumps have gotten big enough now I can divide them. And, um, and so they're a, they're a great addition to, uh, to a garden and they like shade. Um, so in June to August, again, more Texas sage will bloom. It's beautiful. Um, you really want to prune these and prune them hard in February. Uh, so that they keep a good um, uh, a good form. A Rosa Sharon. I don't know if you've never planted a Rosa Sharon or had one in your garden. Uh, they bloom all summer long. They're a blooming shrub, or you can they can become more of a tree, and they will bloom all summer long. And um, just a good constant pop of color in your garden all summer. American Beauty Berry, uh, it's a little invasive. Uh, it will spread its seeds and it will send up sucker growth, uh, but it is a, a purplish berry. We call, it, um, we call it red, but it's not, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful shrub and it'll start blooming in August and September. So some of our late summer tasks that we need to do is take note of the plants that performed well and those that didn't do well. So by the end of August, we're going to know. We're going to know if it's if it's a, like a zone in your sprinkler or drip irrigation is not set right or something like that. So you don't want to move the, the plant or um, plan to move the plant. Don't move it in August. Uh, plan to move it in the fall or rework the sprinkler system or the drip irrigation system. Um, if it's a garden that um, you don't have any irrigation and you try to plant very drought tolerant plants um, and the plant didn't do well, um, there could be a, a couple of other things you might consider that um, maybe, uh, maybe it gets a little more shade than you expected. Maybe uh, it's, not um, um, maybe the plant isn't as hardy as you would like it to be um, or or for that area. In the summer heat, um, if the um, if the summer heat and drought took a toll on your plants, plan to replace them in the fall or winter with more drought tolerant plants. And a lot of us are migrating to those. The problem I'm finding, is a lot of our drought tolerant plants are not tolerant to the 10 degree weather in the winter. Um, so we're kind of we're, we're kind of having to play this game of um, you know text, plants from South Texas can't actually handle our winter. So we've really just got to find that happy group of plants that can tolerate 105 degree temperatures. Um, um, spread. 
So we want to fertilize again. I've talked about fertilizer twice already. We're going to fertilize again in September. Um, and uh, plants will be very happy about that. Uh, and this is really important. We're going to apply another round of pre-emergent um, for spring leaves. And this will go on your lawn. Um, and that will keep the little seeds from um, the, the weeds from germinating. It, it kills them so that they can't germinate in the winter and this, in the fall, I mean, winter and uh, next, the next year. Um, and find some shade because now we're into September and we're all exhausted from the heat. So now, our Septembers are, don't cool off like the rest of the country. Um, so we're still hot, but there's still plants that are going to pop up and bloom and be beautiful in your garden. Um, the oxblood lily, which is the red up on the, the left, um, it's, a, it's a bulb. And I plant them in masses of you know, 30, 40, 50. So they're short-lived blooms. They bloom for about you know, five, six days but they're beautiful. Um, toad lily is a, a shade loving plant that um, sends off a flower stalk that looks like an orchid. Um, you can find toad lilies in nurseries and order them online. Um, it's kind of a neat accent um, addition to a garden. Um, Gulf mealy grass, if you've got a drought tolerant area, um, this is my absolutely favorite grass. It's beautiful for a month in September. You can't go wrong with it. And you have to cut it back to um, the, the crown of the, the plant in February and March, but it just is so showy. And when the wind blows, it, it casts, you know, it, it floats in the wind. It's just beautiful. We also have spider lilies. Um, those are a neat um, bulb as well. And they can be in a variety of colors, or red, yellow, white. Um, uh, the yellow and white ones are harder to find. The I, again, would plant those in mass. And um, I think you would, they uh, will surprise you when they come up. They're really pretty. So other things that bloom, and these are three that look identical. The common senna shrub is on the left. Uh, Copper Canyon daisy is on the top. Copper Canyon daisy, um, some people are allergic to it, so you have to be a little careful with that. Um, if they get it on their skin they'll, and they get in the sun, they'll, they'll break out. Um, Mexican mint marigold. So a lot of yellow for the fall. It's beautiful. And these will bloom until the first frost. Um, and so you definitely want to have those as an addition to your garden. Uh, winter um, white mist flower is the one over on the right. That's in my garden. It cascades down over a uh, retaining wall. It uh, smells amazing and the bees love it. So it's a great um, source of food for um, little honeybees and any other kind of bee for um, getting ready for the winter. Uh, the top left uh, photo is Farfugium. It's a leopard plant. It can come in a spotted variety or um, solid leaf, a giant leaf one. Uh, they like shade, just like your hostas. A lot of people use them as a replacement for hostas. Uh, they bloom in the fall. They send up this yellow flower stalk. If we've had a severe drought, they may not bloom as well. Um, and I found that to be true with mine um, uh, this last year. And then fall aster, um, maybe a little short-lived um, bloom time. It's beautiful when it blooms. It, I have it on the retaining wall and it just cascades down. And it's just absolutely beautiful. It's green all throughout the rest of the seasons. Um, until winter, it dies back. Uh, but in the spring, it's green, so it's not a hole in your garden. Uh, it looks really pretty. And then it just bursts with these flowers in um, October and November. So it's very pretty. And then um, 
and we have fall color from our trees. So the left picture is an oak leaf hydrangea. And I love oak leaf hydrangeas for their fall color. Uh, they just um, have these beautiful rich tones. A lot of people say, well, we can't get fall color in Texas. Well, if you plant a row of oak leaf hydrangeas, you will have them. Now, eventually they'll lose those leaves and they um, regrow them in the spring. Um, a, a ginkgo tree. Um, this tree is fabulous. Every garden needs one. Um, it is beautiful. Look how golden it is. Uh, they come in male and female. Um, you want the male tree only. Uh, they do not, um, most nurseries don't sell the female. The female has a fruit on it that when it rots, it smells like manure. And you don't want that in your garden. And then on the right is a picture of one of my Japanese maples um, that is green all through the summer. And then in the winter, it um, in the fall, rather in November, it turns um, this really bright red. So it's just beautiful. So we can have some fall color uh, in our gardens. Uh, and there's a lot of other trees that will present fall colors as well. Um, but that's another presentation. So I just want to thank you all for attending. And